Welcome to this special episode of Free Voices. I'm Daniel Wilde, and it's a pleasure to be joined by uh, Warren Mundine. Warren is one of Australia's most highly respected and influential businessmen, political strategist, and advocate of Indigenous empowerment through economic opportunity. Warren Mundine has lived over half his life in regional Australia and was national president of the Labor Party in 2006 and 2007. In 2016, Warren was awarded the coveted Officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to the community as a leader in Indigenous affairs and advocate for enhancing economic and social public policy outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Recently, Warren has been a leading public intellectual in his opposition to the proposed voice to parliament. And Warren is a member of the Bunjalung, uh, Gumbangir and Yuin people of New South Wales. Warren is also director of the Indigenous Forum at the Centre for Independent Studies and president of Recognise a Better Way. Warren, thanks for being with us. Yeah, it's always good to have your mother write your CV for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I'm just waiting for the payment uh, at the end of the episode. Um, so look, Warren, we'll, we'll chat about The Voice and your perspective on that. You've been uh, you know, widely covered in the media, your analysis over recent days and months. Um, but to begin with, to, to start the chat, I, I reckon that your life and your history is very much an Australian life, your story of success, achievement, upward mobility. Um, you are one of 11 uh, siblings to your family, lived in modest circumstances, and you're here today as one of Australia's leading public intellectuals. Um, can you just give us a really brief background and biography of, of your life and how you got here? You're right, and, and it sort of uh, fits in with my book. I wanted to tell us a story about Australia and I used my family as that journey from 1840 when uh, Europeans first come up to uh, the Clarence Valley and set up cattle stations and that, well in those days it was sheep but it failed and they got cattle stations and my family have worked on those stations for, mm -hmm. for many years, many decades. Uh, I uh, uh, we, we were very poor and humble type people like my father and that used to live in, in humpies, you know, you've seen photos of humpies and stuff like that. I've got some great photos. Is that photos. like a swag, is it? Or what's a humpy? A humpy is, is like an Aboriginal uh, uh, structure, right. which we, you, you live and sleep in. Okay. And so, um, it, you know, it's a, that was their lives and how they did it. And because, you know, when you, they worked on cattle stations, the, the cattle owners, especially if they'd been in the family for a number of years, they had some incredible uh, archives. And so I've got these amazing photos of my father and my uh, grandparents and so on, uh, living in his Aboriginal life, lifestyle, really. Yep. And, uh, and so, you know, we were a very poor family uh, that worked in the cattle stations. And then my father came back after the Second World War and he was determined to get a house. And so he, he worked very hard for that. And uh, this is where his unionism and Labor Party background comes from because it was the AWU, because in those days they gave us an Aboriginal allowance. Which, so if you were a greater operator and you're getting $100, my dad would get 40 Yep. And so he, he got a, a full salary and that helped him buy a house. That house was, wasn't flash, it had two bedrooms, so it was my parents in one, my sisters in the other, and then us boys, we slept on the veranda. Yep. And and then when my grandparents moved in, uh, they then enclosed that, and uh, and that's how we lived. And in fact, um, I, I didn't get my own bed until I was fourteen. I got hepatitis. The things you have to do to get your own. Well, I remember bed. in your in your book, <laughs> and, and your book is Warren Mundine in black and white, which yeah. I commend to to all of our mm. our viewers. It's at all good bookstores. Um, in your book, you say you had to share a bed with three brothers, yes, and one of them wet the bed. That was the oh problem. yeah, my was... younger brother. We used to we used to beat him up because yeah. <laughs> we were laying in bed, and especially I don't know, he chose winter when he did it, so it right. was just freezing cold, and we're going. Ugh. But yeah, he, he yeah he he actually hasn't forgiven me for that because he'll be known throughout history as the the bedwetter. <laughs> not not one of the bedwetters that are in the Liberal Party. No, no, no. no. Uh, anyway, but. It's so, so, and I, but they, my parents were very strong that, because they had very limited education, and my grandparents didn't have any education really. Uh, so they they w wanted us to have a better life. So they were very strong about education and very strong about working uh, in the work ethic. In fact, my father, uh, being a good old old labour guy, he used to have the the line that when I asked him, I say, "Well, how's 
how's Bob? And he said, well, Bob's a working man, mm. which had all these connotations about he worked, he fed his family, he got a roof over their head, he's getting them to school. Or he said, he's not a worker, which meant this bloke was lazy, he didn't go to work, mm. he, his family was never fed, they didn't have a roof over their head and stuff like that. So he was very strong. And he was a bit of a, a strange character because after dinner he used to clean the table down and... And of course, I was number nine in the family. My older siblings would sit there and, and d debate the, the, the daily activities of yep. what's happening in the newspaper. We didn't have TV then, and uh, which is probably obvious. We had eleven kids, but they had. But it was really, and I sat there as a young kid listening to those debates and those discussions and arguments. So by the age of six or seven, I could actually tell you how the voting system of the Senate was, right. which probably I should have, you know got my parents arrested for, <laughs> for cruelty to children. But they, and, and so when I, I left school, I was always uh, at 16, I uh, finished year 10, they call it now, but in those days it was uh, four form, and uh, did an apprenticeship in a, in a factory in Silverwater. And, and I worked from there uh, as a tradie, as a fitter and turner, and, and then, I, but I was really determined to get a house just like my father. So I worked in a bar at night, and on weekends I worked at a wedding reception area and that was able to get my deposit and at 21 I brought my first home. And, so, and it was, you know, I, I went to a school that was uh, really a trade training school. Yep. Uh, if, you, if you had this grand, grandiose idea of going to university, then of course you had to do engineering because all the other stuff was crap. Yep. And that was sort of like the, 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 the vision of, yep. of the school. Uh, it wasn't until I was about 25, I thought to myself, I want to I want to really do something more in my life. And uh, so that's when I uh, uh, went, got, uh, did a, uh, a program and got into the university. I went to the South Australian Institute of Technology, yep. uh, which is now the University of South Australia. I did business and business management. And, uh, it, and then I went from there, went up for the ladder and all that type of stuff. But I spent a lot of time building gas pipelines and power stations and sewer lines and the treatment works and that. So coming from that humble background, I'm able to relate to a lot of different people and situations. I use my life experience as well as my education experience about uh, how I design and think about things. Mm. No, it's a fascinating life story, and as I say, I think your your book uh, autobiography, Warren Mundine in Black and White, is a is a great read. Um, and if we look fast forward to today, in terms of the the issues facing our nation, the you know one of the primary ones is the voice to parliament. Yeah. And you know you've been at the forefront of this debate, uh, you know for for a long time. Um, in terms of the voice to parliament, I think a lot of people don't actually understand what it is. If you out out in the street, most people would think you're talking about John Farnham or the TV show. You know, so what is it? What yeah. is... A taxi driver told me that the other day, actually. Is that right? What did he, what did he say? Uh, I, I was sitting in the car and he looked at me and he said, you look familiar. And I said, yeah, I'm Warren Mundine. And he goes, oh, yeah, OK. And I said, uh, what do you think about The Voice? And he said, I think it's a good show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. So, um, so in terms of The Voice to Parliament, look, this is something that will be in our constitution. It's a Canberra-based yeah. bureaucracy. Um, and it doesn't really have anything to do with recognition as such. So what, what are your views on, on the voice at a headline level? Well, the, uh, uh, you're right. It, 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 what's it doing is conflating two ideas together. Now, all Australians really want to see the benefits for Aboriginal people and the opportunities for Aboriginal people across this nation. And, and it's really, and so if you look at a, a survey and you ask, do you want to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the constitution? 90% tick. Yep. We want it to happen. But then they added this voice on in the end, which is a different matter. Yep. Uh, you know, normally you would probably do that for legislation and, and that would say so you could change it and do different things with it and that. But by cementing it in the constitution, this is not the way forward. Uh, we want practical outcomes, and I'll talk about when I say we, it's about Australians as a whole. Yep. We want all our citizens to have the opportunities and, and have the benefits of the, the incredible liberal democracy that we have built here yep. and the economic opportunities, which we punch above our weight 
uh, uh, on the global stage, you know. And, uh, and, and so this, this voice is, is, is really, uh, as you were saying, it is a Canberra bureaucracy. Yep. So where we move from 67 to get rid of, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, discriminatory laws and stuff like that, and getting race out of the Constitution and everyone being equal as citizens of this country, uh, now, and, and we've been driving forward for the last 50 years on that, now we're going to go back to those days and get Aboriginals back under the putting race in the constitution and getting uh, and, and getting uh, treating Aboriginals with a, a huge bureaucracy was not going to help them. Mm. Mm. You mentioned 1967, um, and 90% of Australians voted yeah. to remove references to race, mm. um, and about 90% want some recognition today in some form. Yeah. So I think that a modest form of recognition would be the right way to honour the legacy of 67. Instead, what Albanese is doing is putting forward a 51-49 proposition. Whether it gets up or not, it's going to divide us because clearly 80 or 90 per cent are not going to go along with his Canberra-based voice to parliament. So are you worried that the voice to parliament has already divided us as in terms of a debate and that division is only going to get worse? Well, you're right. People talk about this could divide the, the nation. In actual fact, it already has. And, mm. and we've seen that through the media. We've seen that across this country in, in commentary. And, and that, and it, but the, and that, that this is what is happening. That you know, because most people are sitting there going, "Why are we going down this road uh, when all we want to do is is ha work with people who ha have needs to get them to be a stronger part of the Australian community?" Now, uh, look, I just find it bizarre that they they're going to this the way they're going about it. Uh, they should have. They shouldn't have. This, uh, conflated them together, those two issues, and it puts suspicions in, in people's minds. Because when you look at the 90%, when, when you start talking about the voice, it drops down to about 50%. Yep. So even the, the, the wider Australian community uh, are seeing, so what's going on here? And then, then they don't, you're not allowed to have information about it, they don't talk about it, and then they refer, they said, if you, if you want to know about it, go and look at the Karma Langton Review, and that's 260 yep. pages, 270 pages. Yep. Who's going to read that? No one's going to read that, unless there's, they're idiots like us, and, which I did, I've read it. Glutton for punishment. <laughs> Glutton yeah. for punishment. And then, they, then when you come out and you see all the flaws in that, yeah. in that report, they then yep. say, oh, but that's not, that's not the, the, the thing we're going to base it on. And so, well, what is it? Yeah. And, 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 and why, if you really want to unite the nation and bring us forward, you should be able to to articulate that to, to the wider community. This is what we're doing, this is what it's all about, yep. da, da 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 But we don't know. Yeah, no, that's right. You, you mentioned the Karma Langdon report. You wrote a great article in The Australian uh, a couple of days ago on this. And I just want to sort of, I think the most arresting observation that you had was at the end, end of the piece. So I just want to quote a bit of that, uh, what you said. And, and you say here, I quote, the voice won't be some grand meaningless gesture. It will be enormously costly and complex and there will be confusion and chaos um, in its development and to what end. Aboriginal people need less bureaucracy in their lives, not more. A 24-member advisory body is just the tip of a very large iceberg that Australia is hurtling towards, um, like the Titanic, end quote. Um, bureaucracy, I mean, there's no shortage of Aboriginal agencies, welfare and so forth. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Aboriginal bureaucracy issue and how The Voice uh, will just add to that. Well, well Leading up to 67, because we were under the controls, of each state had their own what they called Aboriginal Aborigines Protection Act and Aborigines Welfare Boards, and they had a protector of Aborigines who, who controlled our lives from dawn to dusk, from mm. birth to death. And, and so this is one of the struggles after coming back after the Second World War, and this, uh, this was the interesting part. What a lot of people don't realise is that th th a lot of Aboriginals served in, the, in that war to defend Australia. and. In, against the Germans and the Japanese. And, and when they come back to Australia, all of a sudden they went back to that segregated society. Mm. And it was one of the strange things with the military was the people, uh, you know, RSLs and other people, who said, wait a minute, we just want to have a, a beer with our digger mates yep. that we fought in Papua New Guinea with or Trebrook or mm. something like that. How come we can't do that? And that's where this campaign come for equality. And, and, 
and they wanted to get the race laws out. And within and and well, after '67, they all disappeared, and they and everything uh, everything was uh, you know moving in the right direction. When I was a kid, we didn't even know what a university was, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and now you know 16,000 Aboriginals in university at the moment. Thousands of Aboriginals have graduated. They're, they're doctors and lawyers and 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 accountants and engineers and and tradies. You know, they went. They've done uh, things at uh, trade schools and that. Plumbers. You know, and and uh, people like myself, fitter and turners, and fitter mechanics and so on. So we've had this amazing uh, drive forward. So when people say nothing, you know, nothing's been done. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't believe that. A lot of things have been done. I look at the Indigenous Business mm. uh, Program, which the Coalition set up when I was a pro uh, chairman to the Prime Minister's Advisory Council for Abbott and Turnbull. Yep. 2015, the Aboriginal business sector was $6.2 million. Yep. Eight years later, it's $8.7 billion. And, and, you know, this is the way forward. 45,000 jobs have been created. 37% of those jobs are in regional and remote Australia. Mm. You know, look at the mining industry. 7,000 Aboriginals work in the mining industry yep. uh, from, from uh, skilled workers, tradies, uh, right, uh, right up to um, engineers and, and mine supervisors and stuff like that. 2,300 businesses work in the mining industry. It's, uh, it's, uh, you've got uh, across Australia 3,700 new Aboriginal businesses across the country. This is creating the future. And as anyone knows, if you look at history, uh, economic development is the only way forward. You've got to get educated, you've got to get an educated and skilled workforce. You've got to, ha you've got to, have bit to get, create jobs. You've got to have a, a commercial private sector mm. which makes profits and hires people and does things. Yep. This is what we've done for the last 500 years of history. So it's not yeah. rocket science. It's, it's very straightforward. Yep. And it doesn't matter whether you're an Aboriginal or you're a migrant who's just come to this country or whatever. Yep. This is the way forward. Yeah, oh, that's right. And the mm. only other thing I'd add is you also need law and order and, yes. and community safety, and we're seeing that in the Alice. Um, well, just on yeah, that too, yeah. because one, of the, the, and this is one of the things that the voice is never going to answer. Because, uh, and this is why I, I believe Peter Dutton was right when he said, "Yes, we need to have recognition in the constitution, but then we need outside the constitution for through legislation, uh, f where you have direct communications with the people on the regions and remote areas, uh, because this is where the issues are, the socio-economic issues are, and you're not going to correct them from Canberra or." Uh, having a bureaucracy and people sitting around a committee room to solve those, you actually have to get out there and get your, get mud under your nails and a bit of dirt yep. and work with those communities to deal with those law and order issues and, and then that will help investment coming into those communities. Why would I invest in a community where you know, someone's going to come along and throw rocks in my shop yep. and, and there's going to be robberies and, there's, and, and that. And so they've got to deal with these real issues. Um, some people, including the Prime Minister, have suggested that the voice to Parliament would have prevented the issues in the Alice. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I challenge him. If, if he really believes that, then why hasn't he legislated today? Because in the Constitution they can legislate to do that today. And why wait? And because even if the voice gets up, uh, it's going to be two or three years after that, they said, before they get the design work all in place to set it up. So, so why wait till 2025, 2026, when we, when we know the problems exist now? If he truly believes it will be the panacea, put it in place now. Legislate for it now. Uh, but I don't think it will. All you're going to end up with, and this is one of the problems of talking about uh, looking at our culture. Aboriginal people see themselves like your Jungles and the Bundjalung like me and other people like that. And through, uh, through native title and land rights, what's happened now is that they got a voice at the table. Mm. And, so, and they're, they're a very important voice. And as we know, just recently, we saw um, uh, Andrew Forrest, one of the richest blokes in Australia, who was stopped an irrigation project he wanted to go forward because of those Aboriginal voices on the ground. Mm. So we have those voices now. Uh, we just need to be working and build the capacity of those people out there in those communities and making their communities safe mm. and economically prosperity. 
One of the other myths, and you talked about 10 myths in a widely shared article you had in the Daily Telegraph recently, and the one I like the most is that Aboriginal people have asked for the voice uh, in the Uluru yes. statement. Now, the only way they got to a consensus on the Uluru statement is by kicking people out of the convention they had who didn't agree. Yes. So that's an interesting way of getting consensus. Um, but also... So it takes them back to my old Labor days. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. And, and related to that, you were in Canberra a couple of weeks ago with 22 Indigenous community leaders, including Senator Price, Senator Jacinta Price. Now, my understanding is no one from the Labor Party heard your voices. I don't think the Prime Minister came to hear your voices. So this is not about all Aboriginal voices, is it? It's a certain subset. Well, that's exactly right. We brought people down from remote communities like Nooka and other places uh, around Australia. And, and, and the only people who didn't meet them was was the Greens and the Labor government. You know, what about the <laughs> Prime Minister wasn't there? Uh, the Prime Minister was there, everyone was there. It was, a, it was a sitting of Parliament. The interesting thing was even Linda Burney, who is the Minister for Indigenous Australians, but she didn't want to hear the voice of Indigenous yeah. Australians. I think technically in her title she has a bracket at the end saying only some. Only yeah. some. You know? <laughs> what, only what's, the what's, right what's, ones. what's the old saying? You know, all pigs are equal except yeah. some pigs are more equal than others. That's right. Uh, and so, so, so and you're right. So what happened in that, that they had 13 dialogues around Australia. You was by invitation only. So people like myself and other people weren't invited, or just in a price to other people. Uh, and, they, uh, and then they selected the people to go to, the 250 people to go to uh, Yalata in central Australia, just uh, down the road from uh, the Uluru uh, Rock. Yeah. And, they, uh, and they made the decisions about what was the whole thing was about. So when they say Aboriginal people ask for this, it was like Aboriginal people who were invited, yeah. who think like us, because we want consensus on this, and we've got this nice package that you, if you, that you want, that you got to agree to. And of course, some people didn't, so they got kicked out. <laughs> One of the other myths: opponents of the voice are racist. Um, you said here, I'm quite a few Daily Telegraph <laughs> article. Yeah. I'm Aboriginal and have campaigned for Aboriginal rights all my life. I oppose the voice. Am I racist? Are you racist, Warren, because you oppose well, the voice? Well, obviously, because the uh, Prime Minister and Dan Andrews and Linda Burney and the whole voice campaign yeah. have, have said that, so it's, it's quite obvious I am. <laughs> uh, look, I just find that this is, this is the stupidity of the campaign. You know, it, It's almost like the... the, the and I'm not going to get the the quote right, but at the Margaret Thatcher, you know, when you get, when someone abuses you and, and tries to hurt you mm. with that abuse, then obviously they've run out of ideas and they've run out of how to debate and, and prosecute their case. Yes. And so, so they, they, they're losing credibility. Look, on, on our side, you know, I, I, I got my niece, she's CEO of Reconciliation Australia, love of the deaf, she's on the Yes campaign. People say to me, "Do you have cold Christmas dinners?" And I say, "No, it's, we love each other, and and we do." And a lot of people on the other side, you know, I worked with over the years, yep. uh, and and are, are very good friends with them. So I don't want to get into this stupidity about uh, you know you're a bad person and you're. What we want to do is have a mature debate. Yep. Each people, uh, each person, uh, prosecute their, their their cause and what they believe in, and that. And I believe that we will win that debate. And this is why they're scared and they're abusing us. Because you look at the lawyers who are advising uh, the Yes campaign, they're all split. Yes. They're all over the place. You know, they sit there and go, oh, it's the worst thing that could ever happen, but I'm going to vote for it. You know, some of them really surprised me that, uh, you know, they've got more positions than a person in a twister game. Yeah. You know, they're all over the place. And they still stand up and say, yes, it's dreadful, it's shocking, it's going to end up in court for the next 100 years or 10 years or whatever. And then they go, oh, but we're still going to vote for it. Yeah, that's right. Well, former <laughs> High Court Justice in Callaghan said that this is going to be at least a decade of litigation, in his, yeah. his opinion, because, you know, if something's in the Constitution, the High Court of Australia is going to be involved. You know, of course. Al Albanese can't say you're not allowed to do that because we have the separation of powers. The government can't tell the court what it can and can't do because that would challenge yeah. the whole idea of impartial application of law. So yeah. um, there's no doubt this is going to be in the courts. Well, that's what the High Court's for. The, the legislator makes the laws and, that, and, that's, and that's, they get their powers from the Constitution. And the High Court then tests 
whether that meets the constitutional standards. Mm. So no matter what legislation or what policy that comes out, uh, it will be challengeable. Yeah. And then, then the High Court will make their decisions on that. And we've seen that in a number of cases across Australia uh, where they, you know, they, they have made their dis, uh, decisions about what they do. So this, this bizarre thing, I, I had this debate on, on a radio sh uh, a show uh, and they said, well, in the Carmen Langton thing, it says they won't be able to, to uh, you know, take it to court. And I said, I said, yes, but the constitutional lawyers say you, you will be able to take it to court. <laughs> and they said, oh, but in the, in, but in the Carmen Langton thing, it says yeah. you want. I said, that's fine, you know, as much as I respect Tom Karma and, and Marcia Langton, they are not constitutional lawyers. So I'm, I'll take my brief from the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's a good way of putting it, I think. Mm. Um, look, we know that there are um, a decent number of people in the community who do support mm. The Voice in some yeah. way, shape or form. Uh, we know that that support is declining. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested in your perspective of why, why are there people who support The Voice? Um, is it because they believe it's the right thing to do in the context of recognition and they don't really understand what it's about? Yeah. Why, why do you think they support That's it? That's one of the big ones. Look, they're decent people and, and, and Australians are great people, despite what some people say about us. We're, we're, we're not a bunch of racists. And all this, uh, it's, the, it is about that very issue. A lot of people want to do the, they want to do the right thing, yep. and they want the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands as the first people of this country, yep. and and everyone's on board with that. So that they, 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 and this is where I think the trickery, trickery of it is that the government understands that. So now they stuck this thing underneath, and then they just talk about, oh, don't you want to recognise Aboriginals? Mm. And of course the answer is yes, we do. And I said, yeah, well, you should tick yes. Yeah. But underneath that is this hidden thing, That's which right. we don't know about. Yeah. And so, so a lot of the, so, so I don't chastise or pick on people who are voting for the yes because that's a, a majority of them think that way, and mm -hmm. it's a good way to think. But, but, but when you start talking about what comes under that, that's when they sort of go, uh, maybe you know, why don't they separate it or, or. Or otherwise we're going to have to vote no and so that's one group of people there and the other group of people they believe the the rhetoric that's out there that it's a nice thing to do it's a good thing to do and it's all lovey-dovey stuff and and uh, and especially young people fall for that and they and they think okay we, we you know we've got a dreadful history and all that type of thing well I always say that there's no country in the world that had a good beginning Name me a country that's had a good beginning, mm. and uh, and but it's not you know it's not about rating the people on a uh, country on that past. It's about what is that country doing today, and moving forward, and making a better future for everyone who lives in this country. And we all forget that there's 26 million other people who have come to this country as migrants and through the colonial period, and have contributed to this. Look at this. We we, we live in this brilliant. You know, we're rated very high in the OECD mm. on economics and education and stuff like that, well, and health and things. And it was these people who come to this country and worked in the factories and worked on the roads and worked at, and worked in the, in, in, the, in the retail stores and everything and made this country great and worked in the mines and so on. So, uh, you know, we're, we're heading in a, in a great direction and, uh, and I like to see that continue. Now, are we perfect? I don't know a perfect country in the world, you know, uh, but at least we're trying. Hmm. <laughs> Look, I know you're, you're a busy man and you've got some other campaign events to attend to today, so I just want to finish on a couple of final questions, if yeah. that's okay. Hmm. Um, one of the claims made about The Voice is that, look, it's only going to be involved in a small set of issues directly relevant to Indigenous Australians. but. As we know, Indigenous Australians are Australians. Yes. So you can't really quarantine, oh, well, it's only this, these set of things, it's, it's really going to be involved in, in, in everything, isn't it? Well, that, that's the funny thing. Uh, look, don't listen to my words. Listen to what the Yes campaigners say, Professor Megan Davis yeah. and Noel Pearson and that. When they were asked questions about it, they said, well, they said, and, and I remember that um, the ABC with P Patricia Carvellis, who was trying to push it in that direction when yeah. she asked the question, and he just said, well, it's taxation and it's this and it's this and that. And then Megan Davis said, well, uh, you know, a professor of law at New South Wales University, she said, she said it's everything. Aboriginals are Australian citizens, so everything 
a fixed estate. So that goes right across and uh, for, across all the legislations and all the policies that are coming out of governments. And and then of course uh, Professor Greg Craig, Craven said it will be like they'll have a say in police uh, you know policing. They'll have a say in. Uh, uh, Traffic fines, they'll have a say in, in defence, they'll have a say in everything. Yep. Of course, as Australian citizens, this is the other myth that Aboriginals aren't in the Constitution. As Australian citizens, we're in that Constitution, like every other Australian is. Uh, we, and we just like to have that, that, that recognition. Hmm. But setting another layer of, of, of governance uh, is not the way to move forward. We've got a beautiful Westminster liberal democracy system that works. I think we've got the, one of the best legal systems in the world. I think we've got one of the best democracies in the world. We've definitely got one of the best economies in the world and that, and we've done great things over 200 years, 220 years, and, and, and we've got rid of all the race laws 50 years ago, and, and, and everyone is treated equal before the law, and I, I think we need to continue that journey. And just one last question. Um, this sort of goes to the issue of veto power. I know there's a debate about whether it will have a, a formal, formal veto power or effective one. Anthony Albanese at the Gama Festival in an interview with David Spears on ABC Insiders said it would only be a very brave government that would go against the voice to Parliament's advice. Mm. That's a veto power to me. Um, what's your opinion of how, the, oh, yeah, how look, it would operate? Everyone, look, this idea that they, they won't have veto power, of course in the law it doesn't say that, but the pressure of re reality, you know, and as, as the Prime Minister said, yeah. uh, you know, be a very brave Prime Minister not to, uh, you know, and we, uh, uh, to agree to it. And we saw that just recently. There's evidence of that. So, of course, uh, uh, you know, Mark Travis, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, went to that design committee and said, if, if we go down this track, it's going to open it up to all these other issues. Yeah. And, and they just said, tough. We want that. And they f argued and argued over it for weeks. And then and the Prime Minister stepped in and said, let them have it. So we've already got evidence that that's what's going to happen. So, so and that's another thing about traditional owner Aboriginal communities. They're worried now when they do agreements uh, with governments and, and companies, mm. mining companies, and about projects. So a bridge gets built or this gets built uh, and a mine site gets set up or whatever. That's just the discussion between those groups hmm. for it to happen. Hmm. They're worried now that you will now have uh, people who will be able to go to Canberra, third party people, which we call them in the mining industry, which are the Greens and other people, who are anti-projects. They'll be able to go to the voice and say, hey fellas, da 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 da, and then they'll put pressure on the Minister for resources and that not to tick off these projects. Uh, Warren, that's a great place to leave it. So thank you for your time with us. Thank you for your leadership and everything you've done for Australia and for your contribution to the debate on The Voice. Thank you very much. Authorised by Scott Hargraves, Institute of Public Affairs, Melbourne.